Hello, and welcome to Aqua Rach Art. I am going to be doing a full tutorial today, and the subject of this tutorial will be a master study of Claude Monet's painting called The Esterel Mountains. The original painting was painted in oil, so today I'm going to be focusing on how to do a master study with watercolor of a painting that was originally in oil and still maintaining some of the brushwork and the special characters of characteristics of that painting. Right now I'm just showing you some of the supplies that I was planning to use. I thought I would use some masking fluid, but I ended up deciding I really didn't need it, so didn't use any masking fluid for this project. But it's basically just going to be all of your essentials for watercolor, so watercolor paper, I'm using Fabriano. I'm using mostly Winsor & Newton watercolors, and I'm going to be just using my primary colors, so nothing special. Some tape, of course, a variety of brushes. I didn't show it here, but I'll be using a Hake brush for some of the initial washes. And then I also thought I might use my hair dryer, but I ended up not really needing to use that going to first sketch out the composition on just a piece of copy paper and because this tutorial does involve some drawing I'll make this template available in my Etsy shop so if you're interested in using this template to transfer the drawing onto your own watercolor paper that will be available for you and there will be a link in the description of this video for that. This composition I think is fairly simple as far as Claude Monet goes and I'm honestly not worried about getting my drawing exact because this of course is it's a study and what I'm really focusing on is color and texture and also recreating this oil painting in watercolor but maintaining the original feel, the strokes. It's not that I want my watercolor painting to look like an oil painting, I'm just basically trying to translate this work into watercolor. And if you do choose to use my template to transfer the drawing onto your own watercolor paper, I'll show you in this video an easy way to do that with what's called carbon paper, which is a paper that is exactly what it sounds like. It is coated with carbon on one side and it allows you to transfer marks onto another piece of paper just by applying pressure. But if you have a light box, that's also a good way to do a transfer. And also I think a little bit easier as well. And I'm just right now trying to get the general shape of the tree. So I'm really paying attention to the outer contour created by this sweeping tree. Again, I'm not concerned with being exact, but I do want it to be recognizable. So I'm just roughly trying to get that shape in here. And when I do a sketch like this, I'm not at all concerned with any kind of details, so you're not going to see me going in here and trying to mark out, you know, where leaves are or individual brush strokes. 
I really am just looking at contour so that I know where to block in my paintings, especially in the initial stages of painting. That's pretty important. And the template that I make available, it will be directly from this drawing that I'm doing right here, but I'll try to clean up the lines a little bit because as I go along, I'm correcting and I'm, you know, scribbling and sketching. So the lines can get a little bit confusing, but I'll make sure to put a nice cleaned up version of this available if you would like it. And then you can just print it off on your own printer and go from there. I'm also trying to mark in where there is a lot of sky showing through the leaves of the tree. And that's going to be important because when I'm doing my block in with watercolor, I want to make sure that I do not cover those areas. I want to leave those blue. Because what you'll see me do to begin with is I'm going to lay in a blue wash in the sky and that is going to cover the entire sky, including the area where the tree is. And then when I begin to block in the tree, I'm going to be applying yellows. And so I want to make sure that those areas where the sky is showing through the tree remain blue and I can avoid putting yellow in those areas. So I'm, I was just looking for the most prominent areas in the tree where there's a lot of sky showing through. And a tip too, if you don't have a lot of experience with drawing, this is just a little tip for drawing straight lines. So when I did that horizontal line for the horizon, I know it's difficult to see because not everything is included in the frame of my camera, but I would say a lot of people tend to draw with their wrist, meaning they bend their wrist a lot. And you can actually see me doing that here for small marks, but for large marks that you want to have a lot of control over, you wanna keep your wrist straight the entire time. So don't move your wrist and move your whole arm. And that is going to really help you to get decently straight lines. And typically that's not even that important in most landscapes, but anytime that you have a sea or a body of water and there's a very clearly defined horizon, it becomes a little bit more important. And of course, there's nothing wrong with using a ruler. And I'm just about done with this template. And right now I'm just kind of reinforcing some of the most important lines that I want to make sure are more prominent and correct anything that I don't want to replicate onto my watercolor paper. And the reason that I tend not to just draw directly onto my watercolor paper is because I want to protect my watercolor paper from damage. So if I do a lot of scratching around and making corrections, and then I go in with an eraser, that's going to cause a little bit of damage to the texture of the paper. So I want to avoid that. And so I, I really try to do my sketching on just a piece of cheap copy paper from my printer and then I transfer it onto my watercolor paper. So now I'm attaching my watercolor paper to my board with painter tape. This is just tape you get at the hardware store in the painting department and I like it because when I take it off my paper I've never had a rip with this masking tape. With regular masking tape I've definitely had tears occur. There's also something called artist tape, and as you can probably guess, it's very expensive, anything made 
specifically for artists tends to be overpriced so I don't use anything like that all right so I've got my watercolor paper all taped down and now I'm going to place my sketch on top of the watercolor paper and I'm going to use two pieces of tape at the top just to hold it in place make sure it doesn't shift at all and now I'm using the carbon paper, put the dark side facing the watercolor paper. And then I'm just going to use my pencil to go over all the most prominent lines. And as I apply pressure, the carbon will transfer onto my watercolor paper. And I'm just going to right now kind of check I think it's a good idea after you've made one mark to check and see how dark it is so that you can adjust the amount of pressure you're applying because there might be times where you don't really want a dark line. For this particular composition, I don't really have to worry too much about the amount of pressure that I'm applying except maybe in the mountains in the distance because they're going to be a pretty light value when I paint them. So if I don't want a dark mark showing through the watercolor, I'll just try to apply a little bit less pressure so that I can see where the mountains are, but they will fade out a little bit as I paint. For the tree though, I don't need to worry about anything because the trunk of the tree is very dark. The leaves are actually quite dark, so I really didn't need to worry about that as far as my lines showing through the watercolor paper I don't think that they will even if I apply quite a lot of pressure And even though my sketch was kind of scratchy and unsure at times, I can be a lot more confident at this stage where I'm doing the transfer. And that's definitely what you want to do because you don't want to be scratching all over the place because all of those marks are going to show through on your watercolor paper. And to keep in mind that at times when you do apply lighter pressure and your lines are much lighter, you'll probably have to make a little bit more of a mental note where those lines are as you paint, especially if you are painting a subject matter with lines that you really want to maintain the integrity of. Because you'll be surprised, even with just a light wash of watercolor, it really makes those lines almost seem to disappear. I used to worry a lot about my pencil marks showing through my watercolors, but I really don't worry too much about it anymore because I typically find that even with lines that are a little darker than I would like them to be, it ends up working out really to where they're really not noticeable. They're there if you look for them, but if you're not looking for them, then they really aren't a bother. Always check your transfer before you actually remove your template because you don't wanna to have to try to figure out exactly how to align your template if you missed something important. So that's why I always just take a little peek underneath my template, make sure all the lines are there that I need before I remove the template from my watercolor paper. All right, so I'll be using the column of color that is on the left of my palette. So you'll see there's a, a nice warm yellow up at top. Right now I'm just dropping some water onto each well 
to start activating this paint. So I'll be using that warm yellow at the top, the cool yellow, lemon yellow right underneath it, and then there's a nice warm red, a cool red, kind of like a permanent rose. That next yellow is the yellow that I use anytime I need to mix greens so that I don't pollute the yellow that I want to keep nice and bright yellow. Next, I have phthalo blue, so that's a nice warm blue. And right under that is actually ultramarine blue, which there actually isn't much left in that well. So instead, I'll use Prussian blue, which is just to the right of where the ultramarine blue is. And I'm using my hake brush to wet my paper and to apply the first couple of washes. I gotta be honest, I'm not a huge fan of these brushes because they shed bristles. And I find it difficult to use because even though I've made my paper wet, I still see a lot of bristle marks. And so that's not really ideal, at least in my opinion, for applying a wash. They do fade as, you know, the pigment spreads out and it dries, but it does kind of bother me and it bothers me that these seem to lose bristles quite easily. And obviously I just bought some cheap ones, so maybe that's the problem, but I don't know. And this is actually the smallest one that I have. I bought a set. And the other ones, they're so large that I don't even know how I would use them with my teeny tiny wells of paint. And I'm tilting my board up. And this is the benefit of taping your watercolor paper to something that you can actually move around. So I'm tilting it up so some of that water can start to just flow downward a little bit. So I'm using gravity to help create a nice soft wash. If you do watercolor with your paper lying flat on a table, you're more likely to get a lot of pooling that you may not want. So one thing that I really like about this painting by Claude Monet is that the sky, even though it looks like it's almost just a regular afternoon sky, there's nothing real special going on in the sky, but right down there at the horizon, it's just a little bit pink. So I want to make sure that I keep that very, very light. So I used a lot of water, just a little bit of pigment, and while my blues were all still wet, I went ahead and put in that light pink wash, and I went ahead and let that pink go right into the mountains as well because there's just a little bit of pink reflecting off of those distant mountains. And a nice thing about this painting too that I found was that I really didn't have much downtime where I was waiting for things to dry. There's enough going on in this painting that I, as I worked on one area, other parts of the painting were able to dry. So I really enjoyed doing this just because I didn't have to use any patience at all waiting for things to dry <laughs> because I tend not to be very good at being patient and then I end up kind of overworking areas that are too wet. For the area that is the sea, I started with a wash of the phthalo blue, and then I started going in with some yellow over on the right-hand side where it's going to be a little bit more of a turquoise. So I used my lemon yellow for that and kept it very, very light. And now I'm going in with a lot of Prussian blue just at the point where the water and the mountains meet, so that horizon, because as I look at that painting, it looks like there's a little bit more saturation and it's very distant, so I wanted to use the Prussian blue. It's a little bit cooler than Thalo, although... There isn't as much of a difference between Prussian blue and phthalo blue as there is between ultramarine blue and phthalo blue. So it wasn't quite maybe as cool as I would like it to be, 
And now I'm using my warm yellow to block in this little mass of land. And you'll notice here that I'm not regarding the tree at all at this point. The trunk of the tree is sufficiently dark that when I go to paint that, it's not going to be an issue. I'm going to be able to completely cover up all of this blue. I was just checking there to make sure my sky was dry so I could go and do some work in there again. I'm actually going to start blocking in the leaves of the tree here. But if you have something in the foreground of your painting and it's very dark in value, then you can go ahead and apply your wash on top of that area. Make sure you can still see your pencil or transfer lines. And that's really nice because it's it's just a lot less to worry about and you don't have to work in a way that's fragmented that's very difficult so i'm just using my lemon yellow right now to lightly block in the general shape of the leaves and this is where i'm going to be pretty careful only in the sense that i want to avoid putting yellow on the areas where i want sky to be showing through and this yellow is just going to give me a nice foundation for the shape of the leaves on this tree. You probably won't see much yellow showing through in the final painting. But I don't just want to go in here with a big dark green, even though this tree will end up being quite dark in value. I like to start out light, especially when it's something very organic, like the leaves of a tree. I want to work on it as a mass, but I think if I went in right away with something really dark, it would end up having a feel that was more solid than I really want. And now I'm using my cool red permanent rose to start adding just a little bit more saturation to the parts of the mountains where there's some pink reflecting off the mountains. So you can see I didn't go over the entire mountain range with that pink. I, I used it pretty scarcely, just in the areas that seem to have the most saturation. And then I'm starting to add a couple of glazes onto the landmass where there's a little bit more warm color. For this initial part of the painting, which I refer to as the block-in stage of the painting, I'm using a lot of wash and wet-on-wet -wet techniques just to lay a nice foundation down that I can build upon. But for this painting in particular, this master study, I will be using a lot of dry brush techniques. And that is so that I can somewhat replicate the texture of the original painting, which of course was done in oil. And I, as I look at the painting, I do see a lot of dry brush technique, even with the oil. So I imagine that for certain parts, especially the leaves and even the texture in the water, he loaded up a lot of paint that was not thinned in any way with any kind of medium and he had a very stiff bristled brush and he used that to apply the paint and so there's definitely ways to replicate that with watercolor and that's really kind of my focus for this painting and I also just wanted to explore the different colors. I find that this painting is very saturated. There's not a lot of neutral colors and grays, which I thought was interesting because typically I find that if I'm painting and I want to have something stand out as very bright and saturated, I'll actually end up using a lot of grays and neutrals all around it. And I think my thought process behind that was that if I use a lot of bright saturated colors that 
it'll be difficult to create like a focal point in the composition. But I think that for this painting, the focal point, of course, being the tree, it's this dark quality to the tree that really makes it the focal point, whereas everything around it is very bright and saturated. So really the focal point of this painting almost becomes like the darkest and maybe where we even actually get the most neutral colors. So I kind of just think that's almost an interesting inversion as far as, you know, my own thought process. And my recommendation for painting branches is to hold your brush very loosely and don't worry about following the outlines or the, you know, guiding lines for the branches exactly. And also allow your brush to kind of skip around a little bit. Don't worry about having a lot of completely solid lines, especially for the smaller branches. And in this particular tree, there aren't many branches showing through anyway, so... I say just hold your brush very lightly. That helps you to not apply too much pressure and get lines that are thicker than you want them to be. And now I'm using phthalo blue and lemon yellow, and I'm beginning to actually block in the leaves in a way where they're going to show up quite a lot more. I'm not going to leave much of this yellow showing through. There's only just a few areas that I see in the original painting where I can detect any kind of yellow showing through where the sunlight is hitting the tree directly. So for the most part, I can go ahead and start blocking in my greens. And I'm sorry if you hear my dogs snoring in the background. They're sleeping and every once in a while we get a nice big snore. And I'm starting to try to use more of a dry brush technique here. It's a little bit challenging at this point, and I'm not going to worry about it too much because most of that dry brush can really wait for kind of the final applications of paint. But what I don't want to do is have big, soft washes at this point. So I'm going to start creating a little bit of texture, just trying to at least somewhat limit the amount of water that's in my brush so that I can kind of hit and miss areas a little bit. And what I find too is when I'm using a drier brush to paint, I have to remix my colors. I go through them really fast using a dry brush because there's more pigment and it's not as diluted with water. And I think it's really important too when you are painting trees like this and you want them to have a very airy and organic quality to them. You don't want them to be really solid, especially where the leaves are. It's really important just to restrain yourself a little bit so that you're not applying too much color and filling in the tree too much. So allow yourself to miss a lot of areas. And as we build up this tree, I'll be really glad that I did that because as you continue to work, the tree will just inherently begin to fill in a lot more. And so I think at every stage, you have to make an effort to kind of restrain yourself because we have a tendency to go overboard, I think. I think we all have that. We get into the mode of painting in one area with one specific color, and I think part of it is a hesitation to move on, but we end up staying too long in one area of the painting. At least that's kind of what I've noticed in myself, so I really have to be conscious of that so that I can get myself to sort of move on a little bit faster and not linger too much. So right now I'm just trying to 
um, kind of fiddle around to figure out what my next color is going to be. I think that's way too dark for these mountains. So these mountains, they're a very, very interesting color because there's a lot of the pink reflecting and it looks like probably the light source, the sun is off to the left of this composition. And so those are the areas, those pink areas are getting a lot of sunlight. And then the other areas of the mountains are quite blue. And since I already blocked in these mountains with quite a bit of pink, I'm applying a blue wash on top of them. But of course, I'm getting a bit of a violet or a purple, whereas in the original oil painting, we have a much more cool blue rather than a violet. So that's just going to be the nature of working in watercolor because it's a transparent medium. Whereas oil, you can paint a little bit more opaquely and I'd be able to then get that nice vivid blue. But since I'm glazing with blue over pink, I'm getting a bit of a violet and I will just have to accept that. That's just part of the nature of working in watercolor. But I am trying just to keep my values very, very light for these distant mountains and I'm not going to worry too much about getting every detail, every shadow in those mountains because again, the tendency can be to overdo it. And just because I'm doing a master study, um, I definitely don't refer to it as a master copy because my intention is not to copy every detail and get this to look precisely like Monet's original. As I said, I'm really just kind of experimenting with using the watercolor medium to do a study of a painting originally done in oil and also a bit of a color study as well. So it's a good idea to set an intention for yourself before you start a painting, whether it's a master study or any other painting. Try to identify a very simple purpose for yourself and continuously remind yourself what that is so that you don't get distracted with less important things. And now I'm going in really, really dark on that branch. And all I'm using for these darks is my Prussian blue and my warm red. I usually find that a cool blue and a warm red makes the darkest color. And again, I decided to limit my palette just to those primary colors, so a warm and cool of each primary. And so I'm not going to be using any kind of earth tone or black or Payne's gray or anything like that. So everything I'm mixing, I want to mix just from those six primary colors. So that's kind of just my go-to if I re need a really, really dark value. Warm red, cool blue, it usually does the trick. And these plants on the ground are quite dark as well. And actually the leaves of the tree will end up being quite a lot darker than they are right now. And so right now I'm trying to mix kind of a neutral dark green. So I mixed a green and then I went and borrowed some of that red over on the right. Now it's purple, but it was just red before. And I put a little bit of red into my green mixture so that this would be a bit more of a neutral dark green. So again, Prussian blue, lemon yellow, a little bit of that red that was already on my palette, not much. Just need a little bit of red to neutralize the green just a little bit. And again, I'm restraining myself a little bit here because I don't want to go in and completely cover up or obliterate all these other greens. I just want to add a little bit of dimension. So I'm looking for areas that are a little bit more in shadow, maybe a little bit 
cooler in temperature. And that's one thing too that I'm noticing about this painting is that there's just this kind of blue haze around some parts of the tree. So I'm looking for that and trying to use this darker, neutral, cool green in those areas. And with watercolor, you always want to, of course, work from your lighter values and then build up to your darkest. But that doesn't mean that you're going to be covering up those light values. It just really helps to add a lot of dimension when you let things show through. So let those lighter values show through, even in the areas where you'll be building up a lot more value and color. And I thought one area that was a little bit more challenging than I expected was actually this little sliver of ground that we have down here. The color in the original painting is quite complex. So as you remember, I started out with just a simple wash of yellow because I thought that would be a good foundation for me to build on. But there are lots of earthy reds and even some violets and even some kind of mossy green colors that I'll get around to. So I ended up doing quite a few layers on that ground. And then there's these objects out in the water. I'm not even sure what they are. They're just kind of orangish red out there. And honestly, when I first looked at the painting, I didn't even notice them. And that's kind of the interesting thing too. Anytime I do a master study, I end up realizing that there's many aspects of the painting that I wasn't even conscious of that I didn't even see until I really spent some time looking at the painting. One challenge that I will run into is because I went in so dark on the trunk of the tree, there are some areas that are getting just a little bit of light. And so what I'll end up doing toward the end of the painting is just using a tiny bit of white gouache to add a few specks of light just to give the tree a little bit of dimension because it's so dark and I don't want it to look flat. So now I'm going in with just a little bit more yellow, not really for the purpose of making anything yellow, but to add a little bit more vibrance to the leaves where the sun is hitting them a little bit more directly. And I can also use some of that green from the leaves of the tree down in that grassy area on the ground. And I think it's really important to look for areas in the painting where you can use the same mix that you already have in more than one place so that you get a little bit of consistency with the colors. And now I'm mixing up a little bit more of a dark neutral green. This is going to be even a little bit darker. And you'll see that when I mix this color in particular, I'm using my Prussian blue, I'm using the yellow, but instead of getting my red from the well on my palette, I'm actually looking for places on my mixing palette where I've already put a little bit of red and taking red from there. And the reason for that is that if I were to dip my brush into the well on my palette with all the red paint, I might accidentally pick up more of that red paint than I really want to. So I have a little bit more control when I use paint that's already on my mixing palette because I know that I'm not picking up too much of it. I don't want to overwhelm that mix and make it too red. And now I'm using just a lot of Prussian blue. It's a little bit watered down and I'm looking for areas within the original painting that I get that really vivid blue halo around some of the leaves. And of course, you know, 
I think I tend to see things like that and kind of exaggerate them in my mind. I make them a little bit more prominent than they really are. So again, I'm exercising just a little bit of restraint and not using that too much. All right, so now I'm starting to do a lot more dry brush. And you saw right there after I dipped my brush into the paint, I quickly just kind of wiped it off very lightly on my paper towel, which I'm keeping in my left hand. I'm going to try to show you each time I do that. Out of habit, I kind of keep my paper towel just kind of right next to me off of the camera frame, but I'm going to try to just reach out and extend my hand every time I do that because I do it quite a lot. It's very important with the dry brush technique because with watercolors, it's, it's a very, I think, delicate balance between having enough water in the mix to where you can actually pick the paint up and manipulate it a little bit. And then when you're doing dry brush, you just don't want to have so much water that you're creating washes or glazes because I need a lot of texture. So I want my bristles to show my bristle on the brush rather than a whole brush stroke. I want the individual bristles of the brush to make marks, individual marks. And so to achieve that, the brush has to be relatively dry. So what I usually find is it's easiest to go ahead and mix with a lot of water. And then here you'll see, I'm just wiping it off. There's still pigment in the bristles. But when I apply it, I'm getting a lot more texture. I'm not getting the pooling or the glazing effect of when I have a lot of water on the brush. So in the original painting right here, there's just a little bit of brushwork, brush strokes showing in the sky. And I wanted to include that. I didn't want my sky just to be a flat wash. So I'm using a bit of dry brush technique in the sky just to add some of those directional strokes that I see in the original painting. The key here is that I don't want to do this in a way that it's going to make the sky a lot darker than I originally had it. I want to keep it relatively the same value. So I have to use quite a bit of water just to make sure that I'm not going overboard and making the sky darker, you know, making those strokes too prominent or too contrasty. They really kind of need to be present, but yet very soft and subdued. And then too, with the mountain, I'm just going back in with a little bit more blue, reemphasizing some of these shadows just by glazing. So I'm not using any kind of dry brush technique back here on the mountains because they're pretty vague. We don't want a lot of texture in objects that are supposed to be in the distance because texture reads as kind of being in the foreground. So very light washes back there. And just trying to, I think, subdue the pinks even just a little bit. Again, I may have overestimated how pink those mountains are. So just going over them with a very light glaze will just kind of help subdue them and push them into the distance a little bit more. I'm going to be doing a lot of dry brush in the water, which is kind of a funny thing because, you know, it's water. But there's a lot of texture actually in Monet's water. He uses a lot of brush strokes to create the ripples and the little crests in the water. So I'll be using a lot of dry brush techniques. To start out, I don't need my brush to be too terribly dry, but what I'm going to do is load up my brush in a way to where it's not completely saturated with water so that as I apply it, I can kind of hit and miss certain areas. So the pigment kind of skips around. I'm not applying a lot of pressure with the brush. 
very light and I'm kind of using the broad side of the brush rather than the tip of the brush to do this. I'm being a little bit careful around those orange objects out in the water because they're reflecting a little bit of orange and I forgot to paint that in before so I'll want to leave myself a little bit of space just to put in a couple strokes of orange reflecting in the water so I don't want to go overboard with the blues right there. I also don't want to go overboard with the blue over on the right hand side of the composition where the water is because that's where it's going to be a little bit more turquoise so I'll want to leave the values a little bit lighter and allow some of those yellows to show through a little bit. The water's a lot darker over on the left. Now again, I'm just applying a little bit more of a glaze on those mountains and in the distant horizon. And then using this diluted wash to start applying a little texture. So now I'm going in with a lot of blue, wiping it off. And now I can really start to define the dark waters at the horizon. I'm going to be very careful not to overdo this, of course. But the water definitely looks like it's darker back at the horizon and especially over on the left hand side and then it gradually gets a little bit lighter and more turquoise as it moves over to the right. You can already see a lot of texture starting to show through in the water. Now I'm going to work a little bit more on those objects in the water. I really, I honestly, I have no idea what those things are, but they're there. So, and I mean, I think they have a purpose because they do kind of balance out all those cools a little bit, just that little splash of orange and yellow back there. And then there's even some yellowish orange objects that I didn't notice even until I got to this point in the painting. There we go. So right kind of close to the shore. And maybe this is just a little bit of land peeking through the water. I'm not sure. But they don't really have a very defined shape in the original painting. So I'm going to just be content with using some light glazing to create the impression that that's back there in the distance and maybe it's very shallow water so I don't really need to worry too much about that. And now I'm beginning to analyze this little sliver of ground a little bit more trying to figure out exactly what's going on here, what I need. I have a lot of red and I know that I'm going to add some definition with a dark violet, but I want to make sure that I have all of the other colors in place before I go and do that. I think that as far as that little bit of land goes, I'll wait until I'm just about done to start defining things in there. So that's what I can start doing at this point. I don't want to go overboard with all the reds and yellows and really in the original painting I don't see a lot of yellow but I felt like it was important to have it there to build off from. I do see some pastel pinks actually and I'm not going to worry too much about getting every color exactly right. Now I'm just looking for where shadows are falling. Again I think the light source for this composition was off to the left and so there might be just a bit of cast shadow from the tree on the land, but because of the way that this is formatted, I don't see I don't think that we're going to get a clear indication of a cast shadow from the tree, but basically just putting shadows in where I see them. I'm assuming 
Claude Monet did approximately the same thing. Sometimes with painting, it helps to think logically about light and the way things should be. But, you know, depending on the terrain and where you're sitting and your perspective, you might see shadows that don't necessarily connect directly within your visual field. So it's also very important just to be able to disregard what you think it should look like and just paint what you see. And you can see that this yellow that I'm using right now to mix up greens, it's very dirty. And that's why I have a separate well for that yellow. And I like to use my lemon yellow to mix really vibrant greens. I tend to use my lemon yellow more than my ye uh, warm yellow, which I believe is called New Gamboge in this case. So it's helpful if you have a color like that that you use a a lot and you tend to get it really dirty in the process of mixing. It's good if you have space on your palette just to put it in two different places. So this is my yellow that I use for mixing greens primarily and you can see why because it gets very dirty. It basically looks like a well of green paint at this point. All right, so I'm adding a little bit more green into the water where it's a bit more turquoise. And you can actually see on my palette up at the top in the middle column, there is an actual turquoise, but because I already decided that I'm going to just be using these primary colors, I am gonna try to improvise everything. So I'm not gonna use my turquoise color to create the turquoise water. I'm using mostly the phthalo blue and lemon yellow to create that and leaving it very light in value is very important. Now I'm starting just to add some of this texture into the water, of course being careful not to overdo it especially where I want to keep it pretty light in value because I want those lights, those light colors to show through. And I added just a bit of red to that same mix to get a nice neutral color to add a little bit more definition to the ground. And we're getting pretty close to being finished with this. As I'm painting this, I'm looking at the original painting. It's on the screen of my tablet, which is sitting in front of me. So I'm not trying to hold the tablet really close to me. I'm not zooming in. I'm not looking for every little detail in here. I'm basically, I'm getting an impression of this impressionist painting. And I am trying to keep it pretty loose. One important thing in here is that there, I'm not sure if it's some kind of fruit or what, but there's some little bits of red up within the leaves of this tree. And you might almost think that you need to put those in right away and work around them or even use masking fluid for them. But I think it actually will work best to use my warm red, which is a very strong pigment, and just go over the greens with the red because if, if I was too careful with those reds and I made them really bright and bold and painted around them with all these greens, they would be too bright. When I look at the painting, the reds, they're definitely clearly discernible, but they are not extremely vivid. So I think letting the red mingle with the greens is actually going to be very effective. I'm just adding a little bit of texture to 
the land here using a very dry brush, lots of pigment, not much water. Just looking for areas that need a little bit more texture and definition. And same with these objects out in the water. I don't want to spend too much time on them because they're not extremely important. I may as well just think of them as, you know, little bits of color in this composition. I have no idea what they are, and I don't need to spend any time really trying to figure it out and rendering them in any special way. I think there's a reason that I didn't notice them at first when I started this, and that's because they're really not that important. They do kind of help balance out that big block of cool blue turquoise water, but otherwise they're not that important. And I almost forgot to add in this kind of mossy green that I see on the land. There's just a few areas of it. It's not overwhelming. It's very subtle. And I think it really, it's very important though, even though it's very subtle because it really lends itself to this kind of earthy feeling. And glazing it over all of these reds and oranges neutralizes it quite a bit, but it makes it feel very integrated. Just adding a little bit of shadow to those things out there. And I think that maybe I should have just left the water alone at this point, Hindsight is always 2020, of course. I like the contrast that it has right now between all the dark blues over on the left-hand side and then kind of the lighter turquoise on the right-hand side. But of course, I'm going back in and doing a little bit more work in this area, adding more texture, adding more strokes of this nice vivid blue. And again, I think that we tend to linger in areas where we feel comfortable. And I was starting to feel very comfortable in this water and just kind of playing around with the texture, which, you know, doing a master study, that's a little bit what it's about. You know, I see something in this painting by Claude Monet that I wonder if I can kind of replicate in a way with a different medium. And so I think I got a little bit caught up in that. And so, I mean, it's not like I ruined it or anything. I just think that it may have been better in the long run just to leave it alone. So I'm just doing a little bit more dry brush over there. Completely unnecessary. If you're following along, maybe look at your painting, maybe step back a little while, give your eyes a break from it, and think, do I really need to keep working on this? Or maybe it's done. And I definitely did not get up and take a break when I was working on this. I was just going and going. Didn't even realize how much time I was spending on it. So I think it's really important sometimes just to step back. All right, so I'm using my Scarlet Lake, which is my warm red, which is a very, very strong pigment. And even though watercolors are transparent, um, some are more transparent than others. And so this color, this Scarlet Lake, is a little bit less transparent. And so you can see that even though I didn't, you know, leave any designated areas to put the red, it really is kind of showing through. And you can see that this pigment is so strong that if I 
had, you know, really made an effort to showcase this pigment within the tree, I think that it would have clashed a little bit too much. Applying it right on top of the green, it's showing, but it also looks very cohesive. And again, you know, whatever these are, whether they're some kind of berry or fruit, whatever, I'm not looking over at the um, reference that I'm using of this painting and trying to determine where each and every speck of red is. I'm looking for the, the more prominent reds that I see, and then I'm just adding bits here and there. Again, using some restraint so that I don't overdo it and overwhelm everything with too much red because it is very subtle. Then just adding a little bit of that red glaze to maybe that landmass in the distance. Then I also decided to apply a very light glaze into the landmass that is right next to those mountains, so probably the shoreline, because I do see a little bit more warmth back there. Again, I used a lot of water and a very light touch to apply that in the distance, as you can see right now, because I don't want it to be too prominent. I don't want it to be too warm in temperature, because that will make it seem as though it's supposed to be more in the forefront of the composition than it really is. It needs to be very subtle so that I can keep that illusion of those mountains being very distant. But that's one thing too that I really loved about this painting. Not just the pinks in the sky, but it almost creates this like stripe right through the middle of the composition of pink. Whereas the sky and the water are that beautiful turquoise or cyan. And this too is probably a little bit of overkill, but I'm kind of using a very cool but neutral green just to kind of go back in and add a little bit more depth into the leaves that I don't really think this is going to make a huge difference. It's kind of just me fiddling around but I'm just kind of glazing that here and there where I see a little bit more of that cool halo around some of the leaves. And this painting really is done at this point. All I'm really doing is kind of analyzing the original reference of the painting and trying to pick up any kind of subtleties, especially with color, that I might be able to achieve with just a little bit of glazing. So right now I'm kind of taking a break and just looking at that reference photo on my tablet and trying to decide what I need to do next. And really, of course, again, in hindsight, I don't think I really needed to do anything more. But it's easy to find something. And I decided at this point that I needed to add just a little bit of light hitting the trunk of the tree. It's very dark. It kind of looks a little bit flat. I think when I scan the painting, you'll see that it's not completely flat. There's a little bit of some nice warm colors showing through. But I decided it would be really helpful just to add a little bit of a lighter color just to give the impression of light hitting the trunk. So I used a little bit of white gouache and mixed it with a very neutral color which consists of some red and some yellow, maybe just a touch of blue to neutralize it a bit. And I don't want to go overboard with this and I don't want it to be too light in value. It's going to be very subtle and kind of using a dry brush technique here too where I'm kind of wiping off the brush on my paper towel so that when I apply it to the trunk of the tree it has a little bit of a rough texture. <laughs> 
And now I'm using a little bit more of this white gouache, mixing up kind of a nice reddish orange. And then I can add just a little bit of texture into the land as well. Again, this isn't really super necessary. I don't think it ended up making a huge difference in this painting, but I decided, you know, since I had a little bit more white, I kind of looked for excuses to use it. And the thing that I've learned about gouache, and I don't really paint with gouache ever, but what I've learned is that it doesn't reactivate very well. And so if you squeeze out some gouache, whatever you don't use, you may as well just, you know, clean it right off your palette because it's not going to do a lot of good after it dries. So that's why I think I ended up kind of just looking for places I might be able to use it. So I'm using more dry brush technique just to use that to add a little bit more texture to the land. Nothing too dramatic. And really, I think right now I'm not doing anything super consequential. It's not making any big difference, but I think just, you know, adding a little bit of texture and again, just kind of using up a little bit of that gouache and experimenting a little, that's important. So sometimes it's fiddling, sometimes it's experimenting. Okay. You can see how dirty my paper towel is all the times that I've wiped it off. And amazingly, I only went through one half of a paper towel sheet for this entire painting. So I'm pretty proud of that. I don't like wasting paper towels. So I'm getting a little bit more of that Scarlet Lake because now that the reds have had the chance to dry and dissipate a little bit, I can see that I wanted to add a few more little spots of red that would be a little bit more concentrated. So you can see that I have a lot of pigment and I'm going in just to a few areas just to add a little bit more of that saturated red so that it can show through a bit more. Just kind of gives that green tree a bit more of a warm temperature, which I think really lends itself to this overall composition, which does feel very warm. Almost tropical in a way. And then I'm going in again with a little bit more blue, totally unnecessary. It's really just me kind of nitpicking and being very finicky. Bad habit. And to the danger of me doing this, trying to add this bit of blue halo that I see, in the original painting around the tree is that I'm inadvertently making that tree mass larger than it really needs to be because I'm adding just a bit of mass to the outer edges of it. It's not, you know, too strong or impactful, but I definitely started to become aware of that as I was painting. So I knew, you know, if I fiddled with it too much, I would end up actually changing the size and the shape of that tree. Which, of course, the shape of that tree is extremely important to this composition. Because it's what gives so much movement and vibrance to this entire composition. Otherwise, everything's relatively flat and... There's not a lot of movement elsewhere in the composition. So I managed to get myself to stop painting and now I'm cleaning up my palette. I always take that extra minute to go ahead and just clean up everything that I've been working with as soon as I'm done painting 
And I do that because it makes it easier for me to come back the next day and be in the right mindset to start working again. I don't like coming back to a mess. I'm just trying to clean up these wells a little bit because as I'm mixing, things get a little chaotic. I end up making a mess all over the palette. So again, that's just me. That's my own little weird thing. I just like things to be a little bit nice and tidy. I don't know. And that's weird for me to say because it's definitely, like I wouldn't consider myself the most tidy person in the world. It really pertains mostly to any kind of work area that I have, whether I'm at my regular job or in my studio. I like things just to be a certain way. I guess, you know, maybe ask my daughter, see what she thinks of that. I guess she probably might accuse me of being a bit of a neat freak in some ways. So I really spent that one paper towel. I had to use the other paper towel that I had handy just to kind of finish up the cleaning job. So that other paper towel is completely saturated with pigment. So is my water. I'm almost glad that it wasn't really fully in the frame of this tutorial because it was very dirty, not very nice to look at. So that's it. I'm going to go ahead and my favorite part, of course, is removing the tape because that just really makes everything final. And it makes the composition look complete. I love that clean white edge that you get around a watercolor painting. I really hope that you enjoyed this tutorial and found it useful and interesting. I really like doing these longer tutorials. Hopefully my dog's snoring in the background wasn't too disruptive and I hope that you learned something and I hope that you'll give this a try. If you're interested in any of the supplies that I use, I have a link in the description for everything that I use. It's not an affiliate link. It's just there for your benefit and I'll see you next time. Thanks.